I mean, it's so many kids. It's so many parents. <laughs> it's so fun. It's so enjoyable. I, I, I was, it was the night before the last bike bus, and I was just saying to my wife, like, I feel so fortunate and lucky that like this is the skill set that I've been given. Yeah. That I, you know, I'm able to organize this community, and they've shown up so incredibly. Yeah. And uh, you know, just sort of reflecting on it, nobody asked me to do to organize this bike bus. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Town channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that was Sam Balto, uh, Coach Sam Balto of the Portland area. Uh, for those of you out on Twitter, Bike Twitter in particular, <laughs> you probably know that name uh, because the bike bus that he has been leading there in the Portland area has really taken off. Uh, kids and parents are really responding quite positively to it, and it's really decreasing the number of uh, parents that are having to drive their kids to the school. Uh, uh, and it's a super encouraging story, and hopefully this will be a, a wonderful video to uh, and conversation to help encourage more schools and more um, bike buses and walking school buses uh, in the future. So let's get right to it with Coach Balto. I am absolutely delighted to have uh, with me here today, Sam Balto. Sam, welcome into the Active Towns podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And uh, and Sam, uh, I've been excited about having you on on the podcast, and and I've been following your uh, sort of your story from afar out on Twitter. Uh, but why don't you take an opportunity just to introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, my name is Sam Balto. I'm a physical education teacher in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I previously taught phys ed and worked for a national nonprofit called Playworks um, in Washington, D.C. and in Boston, Massachusetts before coming back to Portland. Uh, I'm a father of two wonderful boys. I love traveling with them in our Urban Aero cargo bike and uh, just become really passionate about active transportation safe routes to school and finding, you know, safe, inclusive and equitable ways of supporting children's transportation. Fantastic. That's great. So when you were back in in Boston, what sort of got you interested in active mobility and kids getting to school? Yeah, it was 2015. Um, I had just finished my master's at Boston University in physical education and coaching. And I got a job teaching at the Ellis Elementary in Roxbury in the center of Boston. And that year, the Health and Wellness Department for Boston Public Schools got a grant through the Bloomsburg Foundation to start a Safe Routes to School program. And our school is one of the 20 schools selected, and I was the Safe Routes to School champion there. And as a teacher, as somebody who had, you know, bus duty, who had parent arrival and drop off duty, you know, chauffeuring kids to and from their cars, you very quickly see how chaotic and how frustrating that can be as a staff member right. uh, interacting with families and just there had to be this better way of doing this. Yeah. The, and you sent along this wonderful classic uh, uh, cartoon. Uh, this is a, an Ian Lockwood uh, cartoon, and I'll, uh, I'll adjust a little bit. Uh, yeah, th this is from a few years ago that Ian had put this particular cartoon together. And, and yeah, I mean, talk a little bit about this. Why did this resonate, uh, you know, so much for you and, and, and for you to send it along to me? I mean, once we sort of, you know, you're a teacher, you sort of see the chaos of arrival and dismissal, just sort of navigating all these different dynamics. And then I saw this, you know, cartoon, and it just makes so much sense how parents want to do what's right by their children. They want their children to be safe, to get to school, and to be successful. And in our society, driving, you know, is that way to, you know, that we deem as, you know, providing a safe way for our children to get to school. But that in turn makes it more unsafe, which then just makes it more chaotic and crazy, getting more children and families into cars. Um, so it's this very vicious cycle that I was seeing firsthand on a daily basis. And it just was not creating a strong school community, which you know is so important for our students' well-being, you know, building strong connections with parents, 
And the Safe Routes to Schools program really seemed like a great opportunity to sort of change that. Yeah, yeah. And so you're at Ellis at this at this time, and uh, and and so if I'm reading between the lines, you started a walking school bus. Yeah, so there's a lot of different um, ways to promote active and safe transportation. One of the you know ways that we had learned about, you know, I'm so new at this time looking back at it. <laughs> uh, and I was, it was a spring, and uh, we tried a walking school bus. So yeah. I sort of talking to students. Uh, there's this one student in the photo. Her name's Nalani, yeah. and Nalani lives. 0.9 miles from school, which means she doesn't uh, qualify for the bus. Right. But the kids that live literally in the next apartment building over do. Right. So I really wanted to create a, you know, support her trip to school. Yeah. And in turn, lots of kids who ride the bus, who are her next door neighbors, decided to join the walking school bus because it's fun, it's active, you get to hang out with Coach Balto. But I was just going to mention that, you know, you had mentioned – um, in this photo, you mentioned that it was the springtime, and I noticed a, a little bit of a change as we make our way over here and we look at this. Ah, look at that. We have some jackets. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So it, it it's, was the first yeah. year springtime. Right. It was a big success. Yeah. You know, and you sort of notice that at the end of every walking school bus day, we took a photo on the steps. Right. And you can kind of see the progression. So then we did the fall walking school bus. I think that this is fall 2016. Okay. Um, and then this is the end. This is the last walking school bus I did. It was winter um, 2018. Yeah. It was like January. Yeah, yeah. And in the photo is the former mayor of Boston, Kim oh. Janey, who joined us, who was our city councilor at the time. Right. And you can kind of just like see the progression of our walking school bus. And, right, right. You know, you're going to see later on the bike bus that I'm doing at my new school. Yeah. And it's just massive. And you think like, oh, I could never do that. But if you, you know, look at that first walking school bus I did, that's what, that's what it's all about. Yeah. It's, you know, it is finding your student who doesn't have, I call them like find your Nemo. Right, right. You know, finding that student who doesn't qualify for the bus, who doesn't have a parent who can drive them, right. who doesn't have a parent who can walk with them or a neighbor who can walk with them, who are walking to school on their own. Right. And if you can find that student and make their walk to school safer, you're going to make a better student transportation options for all students. Right. And, you know, right here on the screen, this is sort of each time we did a walking school bus, we'd sort of try different routes. Got and it. as a teacher, I had access to the student list so I could make a map of where all the kids were. Um, and depending on what school district you're in, you can have access to the bus stops. And I think the thing that's so interesting about looking at school bus stops is lots of times bus stops are in walkable or bikeable areas. So in the right. city of Boston and in Portland, Sean, if you and I live on the same block, but I live on the 0.9 side of the block and you live on the 1.1 mile side of the block, you qualify for a bus and I don't. Right, right. But arguably a walking school bus or a bike bus is a better option for you to get to school. Right. It's, you know, active, We'll get into all the benefits of, you know, being physically active in the morning. Yeah. It's more, you know, you're building a community, you're outside getting fresh air, you're interacting with neighbors and, you know, just seeing the chaos of, you know, bus arrival, buses coming late, you're rushed eating breakfast, uh, you know, the chaos of parents dropping off their kids, rushing them out, the pollution, Versus a walking school bus. You just, once you see those two, you know, those juxtaposed against each other. Right. I just can't stop talking about how amazing these, you know, this is as a way of getting to school. Yeah. Um, so now in, in the difference between these two maps, obviously, uh, what, what do the, uh, the, the colored uh, markers uh, indicate? The colored markers are just different bus stop, stop routes. Got it. And then over yeah. here... 
Boom. Now we you've got your that. route. Yeah. Yeah. And and so each time we would just try different routes. So the first route we've done every single time. And then each walking school bus day, we would try to incorporate different routes. Nice. And the thing that's really cool as a teacher, I have access to the student uh, information. So I could call, you know, let's say, John, you really want to participate, but your parent might not get a flyer and be like, wait a second, I don't drop him off at the school bus. I'm going to drop him off at this other place that he's going to walk to school. But I can call your mom and say, hi, John's mom. Like, John really wants to participate in the bike bus, the walking school bus. Like, myself or this other adult is going to be there. This is what happens. Uh, Really helps to sort of make that connection. Right. And what I think is so cool when I look at this map, it gives me chills because, you know, B on the map is the school. Right. And we're all sort of converging on the school. Yeah. And, you know, your bike, your walking school bus or your bike bus gets bigger. And then you meet at the front of the school and you just see everybody and you're sort of like approaching at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just this wonderful energy that really <laughs> cannot be beat. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and it's fun along the way. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We have Wally uh, join us for one of the walking school buses. We've had, we, we've been so lucky with, you know, city councilors, the uh, community police agents came and, you know, support us. Uh, just so many people love, you know, this idea of walking and biking to school and wanting to support it. And I think um, it's just really exciting to see the progression over the past, you know, seven years, six, seven years that I've been yeah. in this field. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Just how it's progressed. And when I moved to Portland, you know, being able to have success at my new school, right. pretty much having the same support and uh, building that momentum. And I think what I've sort of realized is this idea of volunteerism, you mm-hmm. know, relying on parents to lead these types of things, What you know, walking school buses or bike bus, it's wonderful, but it's not equitable or sustainable. Right. You know, yeah. we really have to look at changing policy, just like how we fund school buses, yeah. you know, with dedicated funds. We need to create options to have funds to support and to pay parents, you know, community members, seniors, whoever would like to do this, you know, to lead these because it, it's, it provides a service to the community. Right. And as a phys ed teacher. And I think what really got me while I was in Boston is the kids only had PE once a week and they had recess. Really? Once a week? Yeah, once a week. And that's pretty standard. Wow. Um, They have recess. They have PE, physical education once a week. They have recess every day for let's say 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So once a week, the kids are getting the 60 minutes of physical activity that they're required, you know, that the CDDC says, is good for children's growth and development. Yeah. And as a phys ed teacher, you're like, how can I support more physical activity? Yeah. Yeah. And myself as someone who loves walking and riding my bike, it just made sense. You build the physical activity into your schedule. Yeah. Yeah. And there's tons of research that shows that when you're physically active, when kids are physically active, they do better in school. Yep. They learn better. They get in trouble less. They have better social connections. You know, the benefits are tremendous. You're right. And it just is such a obvious connection for me to find ways to support their physical activity. Yeah. 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 In fact, uh, uh, one of my favorite books from uh, a few years ago may have actually even been as much as a decade ago is uh, a book uh, entitled uh, Spark uh, by Dr. John Rady. Um, He's from Harvard uh, there in the Boston area and uh, a tremendous book. And he really gets into the science of uh, how physical activity is so impactful to children um, and even gets down to the brain level and, and, and really looking at how important it is at brain development. And then, uh, and continuing on, not just for kids. I mean, also looking at uh, the impact that uh, that 
it has physical activity has on um you know even our brains as we get older and being able to you know prevent alzheimer's disease and dementia and, and those types of things so it's good stuff you, i mean that's the book i read yeah, you know that's you the, yeah we're speaking the same language yeah. that book was incredibly <laughs> transformative in yeah. sort of how i see these opportunities yeah yeah now there was another walking school bus uh chavez and yeah. uh is that also in in the boston area or is that uh, over that in... was in portland ah, so okay. we had our uh, first child our first son in 2018 and we moved to portland oregon where i met my wife and uh taught phys ed there at north portland and our school had a safe routes to school program and there was already momentum um and i just sort of brought my experience and expertise to sort of help organize it more fantastic and so here's just some photos of the walking school bus you know on a beautiful Portland, typical foggy <laughs> morning. But again, foggy, you know, typical day. But it, and let's 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 address that, you know, because you know, kids they don't care. You know, it might be foggy, it might be cold, you know. It's so interesting, you know, parents are they mean so well. And I say this <laughs> as a parent for myself, like so many times I'm doing these things and I'm like, I hope there is someone that calls me out and that like pushes me as a parent out of my comfortable zone. Yeah. You know, because parents will be like, Oh, it's raining, you right. know, or it's, it's too cold. And then I just say to them, like, or I'll say to their kids, there's no bad weather. There's just bad clothing. Right. Right. And they're like, Oh yeah. <laughs> that's right. And I think that's the importance of the consistency of these, you know, active transportation ideas right. is you can plan for it. Yeah. You know, if you know you get to school on the walking school bus or the bike bus, you're going to plan accordingly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And l like I always remember, there are children who don't have choice. Right. You know, they have to walk in the rain and the snow. And the, you know, walking school bus and bike bus makes it safer for them. It yeah. builds stronger school communities. Yeah. You know, you get physical activity and socializ socializing. Yeah. And I think the socializing, we do not understand how incredibly persuasive kids are right. and how much they love hanging out with our friends versus yeah. hanging out with us. Right. And tons of times, like, parents will be like, oh, my kid doesn't, you know, like, oh, they're not going to get out the door because, like, maybe we have to leave earlier. And I'm like, oh, you don't know, <laughs> like, yeah. the power of their friends. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The fact that they're going to be meeting up and the fact that it's a special day. It's a snow day. It's like, right. heck yeah, Absolutely. we want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And this and obviously think, is back in, 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 uh, in Boston. Uh, but yeah, every, every once in a while, a little snow in Portland though, too. So, you know, and also I think, you know, thinking about these ideas, I, I had a meeting, I was really fortunate and I was able to support the new mayor of Boston, Michelle Wu, on our student transportation policy. Fabulous. And yeah. looking, when you look at, you know, how much the city of Boston spends on school buses, it's 10% mm -hmm. of the school budget. It's over $120 million. Right. And on average, the kid who rides a bus is $3,000. Okay. And if you... And now I'm not ever going to say like, I'm going to take a school bus away from you, right. but in a lot of chances that I see a walking school bus or a bike bus is a better service. Right. And if you can remove kids from the bus, but instead of a bus, you're providing them a walking school bus with trained adults who lead it. It's every day. It's consistent. It's a huge cost savings right. to the district, to the school, you know, maybe you could purchase more staff. Maybe you could purchase more supplies. Maybe you get a community agent or a nurse. You know, there becomes this huge amount of money that becomes available. And I think it takes you take this whole, you know, holistic approach where the city of Boston prioritizes or any, you know, cold city prioritizes shoveling the walking school bus routes first. Right. Yeah. And that's sort of that curb cut effect where you're supporting these students walking or biking to school, but that everybody in the community also benefits from that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, before we go back to Portland, um, I want to stick with Boston just a, a little bit and uh, some of the tactical urbanism uh, pieces that you, you sent my way. W- what's going on here and uh, and kind of give a, a little bit of the background on this. So our school is really fortunate in, uh, in Boston and we had support with the health and wellness department to bring Mark Fenton who oh, is a yeah. sort of walking expert and he sort of leads communities on organizing and uh, finding ways to improve the built environment. Yeah. Mark, is, think, Mark has been doing this for a long time. Mark's yep. my hero. Yeah. I mean, and it's sort of like talking about this. It's like all these things are just piling us to understanding why I am here today. Right. And Mark is definitely one of those people for me. Yep. And, um, you know, you see, it's like, oh, we can't do that. It costs this and this. And then you go out with Mark with some codes and then you see cars slow down. Right. You're like, wait a second. That's all it took. (laughs) You know, and also at the same time, who's been on um, Jonathan Fernig, who was in Boston. He was into tactical urbanism. I I consider this photo with, uh, at the time, Mayor uh, Marty Walsh, who's now the uh, labor secretary, um, we, I call it, I consider this tactical urbanism. We were, there was an unsafe crossing in front of our school. Right. And we heard that he was going to be at the park by our school on a Saturday. And I sort of organized the parents and we gave them a present of a, you know, a safe routes to school t-shirt. And then we said, Hey, this crossing's unsafe. Right. You know, we also, yeah. uh, I'm sort of known for putting Tom Brady's face uh, the school crosswalk side. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so that, you know, brought a lot of attention, but you know, it took a lot to sort of start changing the built environment. Right. And really excited that after leaving Portland, the city of Boston applied for mass dots, safe routes to school funds. And they're in the process of doing a million dollar infrastructure improvement for the Ellis and three other, four other schools in the neighborhood. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's really awesome. But I think, you know, seven years, it's going to yeah. be like eight or nine years from the time that the, you know, from the parent, Miss Yvonne complaining to me, telling me that it's unsafe to cross the street right. to actual like cement infrastructure change. Her kids in high school. Yeah. 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 And tactical urbanism is this beautiful thing that we can make those changes so much quicker yeah, and yeah. cheaper and we can involve children in it right? and we can involve the community in it. And, well, and, it, and it can be fun. It can be colorful, oh, you know, it can be impactful. And uh, uh, I, I've had the honor of having uh, Mike Lydon on uh, the podcast twice. And so uh, he and Tony Garcia are the authors of the book Tactical Urbanism. And it's it's just so wonderful to see um, that, you know, that spirit, that, you know, that concept of, of like lighter, quicker, cheaper. Let's engage people. Let's get it out there. Let's have some fun. And kids really moved you know they they're attracted by that they love getting engaged with that yeah and if you want to pull up those last two photos again yeah of the mural so this is something we did at my school in portland we okay so this is portland um, yeah yeah so these two this is our school parking lot and our school was awarded the america walks community change grant and we got some funds and uh we had done a walk on it and the parents of our school had identified (laughs) For all things, the school parking lot right. was unsafe. Right. You know, you're like, oh, the, the space that is right next to where children are supposed to be and right. learn and have to go to. Yeah. Um, and so parents advocated to close one of the entrances to sort of yep. calm it down. And then we wanted to really brighten the space and to, you know, just make it more joyful and more community oriented. So we right. had a wonderful mural painting and these students designed the butterflies. So this is sort of one idea. And then on the other side of the parking lot, this is right outside the kindergarten classroom. They did a solar system and nice. with stars and asteroids and, you know, planets. And I think the thing that is so cool and as a phys ed teacher, I'm really passionate about is this idea of movement spaces Right. You know, finding yeah. underutilized asphalt 
reclaiming it. Right. And you don't have to do much to get, to, you know, to make it child friendly. Right. You really just have to create space that is car free. Right. And I remember seeing one of my kindergartners and she's leaping yeah. on the, she's leaping on all the different stars, you know, yeah. Yeah. leaping is one of the more challenging locomotor skills that, you know, we're, that children learn. Yeah. And yeah. so just creating these opportunities for play, physical activity and working on their skills is really uh, special and yeah. really important. Yeah. And you, you just you just channeled this. And so I went to this photo, as you yeah. said, re- repurposing and reimagining these massive uh, expanses of, of asphalt that we have. Yeah. And these are uh, aerial Google Maps photos of traffic gardens right myself and a group of pt uh, teachers for portland public schools we painted this is five we painted six traffic gardens during the first summer of the pandemic in 2020 um some are sanctioned some are not right so some were with permission and some aren't but um just finding underutilized asphalt space. Some are on like the playground and we go around, you know, right. four square, the basketball courts. Uh, but some are just in the school parking lots. Yeah. And school parking lots, I'm just like, are this incredible space <laughs> that we could be using so much better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, school is, pa- teachers need to draw, you know, depending on where the school is. But when it's not in session in the evenings, on the weekends, during the summer, yeah, we can use that space to bring community together, to get physical activity, to you know put a futsal court in, play yeah. pickleball in a school parking lot. Like there's so much opportunity for fun uh, and opportunities to play. Yeah, that uh, creating traffic gardens was sort of this no-brainer that they went very well together. Yeah. So when did the the idea of the bike bus take hold for you? So I had always been, I knew, you know, with walking school buses and bike buses go hand in hand. Yeah. And, and some people, and by the way, some people do call them bike trains. So yeah. uh, your friend Megan up uh, in Hood River, uh, Oregon there, uh, she uh, uh, was on the podcast uh, uh, also recently in, in, in hers, is, she calls it the bike train and she's the bike train conductor. Yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. Megan's yeah, amazing. Thing, but it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's sort of, when the pandemic hit, it was beyond logical that school buses were going to be overcrowded. You know, like you couldn't pack school buses the way we had. Um, And Megan had been doing the bike train for a little bit of time. And then we saw this video in Barcelona go absolutely bonkers viral. Yeah. Um, Bonkers viral. Oh, it's narrowing in on a million views right now. I I was looking it up. There's another video, like another group of videos that has like 2.3 million. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, I mean, for our world of transportation, I'd say that's pretty bonkers viral. Yeah. yeah. Um, So it was kind of on my radar. And then, in San Francisco, mm-hmm. um, they were doing the bike bus, sort of like took inspiration from Barcelona. San yep. Francisco had a lot, of, you know, there's a lot of uh, safe streets momentum going on there. They had the bike bus going on. That was looking really cool. And I just sort of saw it as an opportunity to motivate myself, but also just to bring more awareness to bike buses, bike trains. And I sort of made this call to action um, to do bike bus for Earth Day, yeah. Um, to sort of have a pseudo competition to see who would have the biggest bike bus for Earth Day. Yeah, and this uh, is know, the so, this is the San Francisco one that Jeffrey Tomlin yeah. had uh, posted. Yeah, and there's just something really eye appealing, you know, like content appealing to seeing a bike bus. Right. The children on it, the, you know, hearing it, just the enjoyment, how calm it is. Um, so it's just, they've just been really popular. And I kind of sort of took this momentum that was being created and just wanted to do it at my school and try to, you know, motivate more people to do it. And so we did the bike bus for Earth Day at my, uh, I went, I'm at a new school this year, Alameda, Alameda okay. Elementary. Right. In North Portland, in Northeast Portland. And so I just kind of 
<laughs> you just so, did it. <laughs> I, yeah, I kind of uh, a month before I was sort of like go up to parents who rode their bikes with their kids. Yeah. And I was like, hey, I want to do this bike bus. Like, can you help me? And then I'd get their email. Yeah. And I sort of that, you know, so I had like a group of like five to 10 parents, a couple of teachers. Uh, so I sort of felt like I had a group. But you yeah. don't need that many people to do it. You right, literally right. just need, you know, yourself and one other person. You got to yeah. do these things with at least one other person. Yeah. Um, and it went bonkers. Who gets music going? <laughs> so that's Evan waiting. Here they are. And, and, I think this is, and I think this is the video that I, uh, when I really started catching on to uh, that you were starting to do this, uh, this is probably the video that caught my attention. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. this was this was the first one we did. Yeah. Um, and I think we had 70 kids participate. Yeah. And then the video goes on for two plus minutes of kids biking by. Yeah. It's just um, nuts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like we had 70 kids participate. We had tons of parents. Yeah. And you're just like, oh, this can't be a one time thing. No. Yeah. And so we, uh, you know, we went at it again and we just sort of took a week off. And then I just sort of decided like, I emailed the email group and I said, Hey, do you think we could do this? Do we have an, are, are enough of you available to volunteer every, you know, every Wednesday? And, you know, we had enough paired volunteers. Yeah. And, uh, and so this is uh, the part of the route. We added a second route and the, uh, that's where the kids meet up. This is yeah. the big hill that we have to go down. So we sort of hang out at the bottom for a little while before crossing a rather busy street. Right. But that's, you know, this big hill we have to go down. There's the kids waiting. We sort of jam out. Yeah. And then uh, this is us turning right before the school. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's so many kids. It's so many parents. It's so <laughs> fun. It's so enjoyable. I, I it, was, it was the night before the last bike bus. And I was just saying to my wife, like, I feel so fortunate and lucky that like this is the skill set that I've been given. Yeah. That I, you know, I'm able to organize this community and they've shown up so incredibly. Yeah. And uh, you know, just sort of reflecting on it, nobody asked me to do to organize this bike bus. My right. admin did it, parents didn't ask it. Um, I just sort of knew that like this is something that we really wanted and we really craved and we really like needed as a community. The right. children needed it. Right. You know, the parents needed it. I needed it. Yeah. Um, and when you sort of put these things out in the world, people take to them. Yeah. You know, when you're sort of presenting the chaos of school drop off to biking with your best friends, it's not really comparable. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So let's let's kind of take a step back and um, let's go to to the fact that you you you've decided. Okay, I'm inspired. I want to do this, and uh, and, and and you're like, okay, I need to figure this out. I gotta. How do we create this? Right. So you've sent me a few maps, and so we'll start here, and we can you know we can flip right through these maps and yeah, sort of so walk us first, walk us through for yeah. from the standpoint of especially for uh, you know maybe you know other people around the world that might be interested in doing something similar. What do they need to know about? you know, the environment and, in looking down on this map of, oh, okay, how, how do we do this? Yeah. So I think I'm really strategic in how I pick the, like the routes. Mm -hmm. I'm also very flexible in it. So, you know, I try something, if it doesn't work, I'll try a different route. And so if you can see on the map, sort of, it says Alameda, there's a orange house. That's the school. Um, it's, um, and then if you go to the next slide, Okay. Uh, this is the bus routes. So all uh, the letters okay. are, there's four different buses and sort of taking the same approach that I had in Boston, sort of paying attention to where the bus routes are. Right. Uh, right. Because that I feel really gives you an opportunity to provide a different service to those families, to those kids 
and in doing so, so let me let me uh, jump in and ask you a quick question so yeah. um it, it looks like this is about 20 some odd blocks uh you know short residential blocks on these uh, these avenues in the northeast uh, quadrant uh, yeah. there in in portland uh how many miles is that from you know the typical bus route, like say the the one that's going, you know, right down on Fremont there, uh, from A all the way to the school. How many miles is that? It's a little more than a mile and a half. So it's not very far. Got it. No. Okay. No, it's not very far. Okay, but good. in Portland, if you live more than a mile, you qualify for the bus. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So just sort of looking at this, you can sort of see, and it's sort of like bus kids. You know that they're a market that you can advertise to. You know right. that they're going to get on the bus. You can handle flyers. You can sort of specifically like uh, cater to try to reach them. Yeah. And in doing so, all the kids that live within a mile who don't qualify for the bus are also getting this service. Right. Um, this is something that is also really helpful that probably you would, ha you would have to partner with a staff member or, you know, admin, if you go to the next slide. Oh, that's the, that's all the bus stops that are a mile to a mile and a quarter, which kind of help with the making of where the uh, bike bus routes are. Got it. And then the next, this is just sort of a pit of where all the kids live. Got the it. The catchment zone. The catchment zone of the kids. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And you can sort of see the chunks. And so this slide is just sort of a straight line down click attached. And click attacks are Greenway. Um, right. And so it's a sort of preferred biking route. There's speed bumps. There's more signage. This Greenway has one diverter. Um, so there's some traffic calming that make it a little bit more preferred for bicyclists. Right. Um, and so our first bike bus, we did this one, this route from 53rd straight down click attack to our school. Nice. But then there's, you can sort of see by Wilshire Park, to the north, there's some bus stops that are being served. Got it. So I, I live really close to Wilshire Park. So I was like, you know what? Let's serve those kids and let's make my life a little bit easier. Let's <laughs> add another route. Yeah. So we uh, that's created what we did. a route. Yep, that's what we did. And, you know, so you're engaging a whole new group of students. You're bringing more kids in. And it also brings that excitement of the kids coming together at spot B. Right. So, you know, one group gets there first. We're, there's people waiting there. One route gets there. The other route gets there. We sort of have a quick huddle up, you know, say a couple words, and then we, you know, take off. And then we bike the rest of the way to school. Nice. Yeah. And you can sort of get an idea of how many kids yeah. uh, this service provides. And it's, I mean, it's, I have, there's a family that lives across the street from the school. Yeah. And they bike all the way up the big hill to the B spot. Because it's fun. It's fun. They want to do it. And like, you know. And they want to be with their friends. I mean. And, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, as a parent, we want to see our kids being a part of community. Yeah. We want to be see our kids being a part of something. And I think that's something that was really surprising to me when I talked to parents about why they thought the bike bus was so successful. Right. You know, we have, there's a lot of things that we're fortunate about our school community. Like we have tons of kids who already know how to ride bikes. Right. We have good infrastructure, but a lot of the parents said like, we really want, our kids really love being with the community and being with their friends. And right. the parents really love that too, seeing right. other parents, seeing the kids, seeing their kids interacting with kids. And I think that is just something we, I think is even heightened because of the pandemic, You're right. but it's something we don't talk about. It's like, these are really important opportunities to not only build strong school communities, but just to build strong communities. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I paused on this just so we can uh, see that. Okay. So this is every Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Got it. And, yeah. um, and I believe that you also, uh, you know, did a little bit of a, um, uh, a post year was it was it a post year uh, bike survey? Yeah, post year. I think just one thing with yeah. the uh, the flyer that I give out. Yeah, I think something. I, I'm I'm ruthless in my like 
promotion. Right. I, I used to, I was in 2008, I was a field organizer for Obama in Northeast Pennsylvania. Yeah. And I, I was fortunate and registered well over 2,000 people to vote. Yeah. And like, I'm fearless. I <laughs> just will walk up to anybody and right. engage them. Yeah. And so I just walk up to every parent. Hey, bike bus, have you heard about it? What could I do to help? And I think it just is this amazing way of building, having connections with families that is not like, I'm talking to your mom, John, because right. you're in fifth grade and you'd read at a second grade level. Right. You know, I get to talk to your mom, your parents about, hey, I really want John to be a part of this walking school bus. I right, really right. want him to be a part of this bike bus. What can I do to help that happen? Right. Um, and so this is a survey um, that I did. I think like 40 parents filled it out, pretty informal, but, you know, just asking for feedback. And then I asked uh, on non-bike bus days, how does your kid, you know, usually get to school? Right. And I was blown away. It was like 40%, but now it's like at 36%. I think it's like 13 or 14 respondents said they drive. Yeah. And it's like, that is climate action. Right. In the, you know, in the works. Like right. To remove... And that's only of the 40 of the like 140 kids who participated. Right, right. You know, maybe yeah. it's, so it's even more than that. You know, removing actual cars from that trip yeah. creates a calmer, cleaner, safer environment around the school. Yeah, yeah. And it also speaks to the fact that uh, when you look at the smallest uh, slice of the pie here of the people who, of the kids, you know, are, are biking anyways, um, you, one would hope that, uh, as this continues on, we're able to see them, you know, on the, the non bike bus days or, you know, we hopefully see that share of, of kids, you know, feel and parents feeling as if the kids have a, a safe enough route and they can, you know, buddy up with friends and be able to ride together into the school. Absolutely. I mean, as soon as I started sharing the idea of a bike bus, my yeah. fifth graders organized themselves. Yeah. So they were doing the bike bus before, you know, <laughs> I did the bike bus. Right. Just because I had sort of been like, hey, you can organize yourself. Yeah. And then at the end of the year, it was like the last week, a third grader, Abby, came up to me at the end of the day wearing her helmet. And she goes, thank you for starting the bike bus. I ride to school every day now. And right. I was just like... Oh, tears, the waterworks. <laughs> I was like, "Oh my gosh, that that is that's, thank you. that's it. That's why that's we do it. this." <laughs> and you know, like this third grader, like these are memories she's always going to have. Yeah. This is behavior change. Yeah, this is empowering them to you know take ownership in their health, in their physical activity, in yeah. their community. You know, it's it's. I again, I just feel so fortunate and yeah. uh, lucky that I get to be that person at this school. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Now, are there any other things that we haven't talked about with the bike bus before we move over to a different topic that you think is really important to, to sort of point out? And while you're doing that, I'm just going to roll some of the uh, bike bus video in the background yeah. here. I would just say to anybody, you know, you start to see these viral videos and you see hundreds of kids participating in these families and if you remember at the beginning of the podcast, my first walking school bus was like five or six kids. And I was equally excited yeah. as, you know, that morning that kid showed up as I was the last bike bus when 140 kids showed up. Right. And it's just about being consistent, being inclusive, um, and just really creating, you know, an environment and world that you want to live in that is, you know, inviting and fun <laughs> for, you know, everybody in your community and yeah. people will pick it up. They will see that they'll see the positive, the good intention. And, uh, you know, they'll really, you know, be there for you. Yeah. And what's interesting when we look at this footage too, I mean, this is an example of one of the uh, traffic calm streets. I mean, we're, we're not talking about, you know, Dutch caliber 
infrastructure here with protected bikeways. We're talking about you know traffic calmed shared streets. Uh, I've ridden on many of these streets in Portland, and uh, and especially when they do have some of the diverters that helps you know bring the traffic numbers down. And again, the traffic speeds have been calmed down, um, and and that is a big part of the infrastructure that is out there in many of these. Um, you know, in, in many of the areas of Portland and many other uh, North American cities that really have a great amount of potential, uh, because as you can tell from these streets, they're not wide enough to be able to have necessarily protected bike infrastructure and separated bike infrastructure, multi-use paths and, and, and all that. Uh, but they are uh, an opportunity since they're residential areas for extreme traffic calming and, you know, when the kids take over, the kids take over. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think traffic calming uh, is absolutely, you know, a key ingredient yeah. um, to this. And bef- until the traffic calming comes, I think organizing these uh, events is really important to help get us there. And what another reason why I love lingering on this too is it really helps reinforce one of the mantras that I have and that with the Active Towns Initiative and that is that streets are for people and streets have been around for thousands of years and we didn't seed them over to the automobile uh, until the automobile still started to really take over and take control in the 1920s. And so it, it, it really helps reinforce that, uh, especially in environments where there isn't an opportunity for separated and, and protected infrastructure, uh, that in fact, streets are for people. And we need to learn how to be more patient when we're drivers, slow down, <laughs> be patient, you know, uh, yeah. because we have to share that same space. Yeah, I would say that has been the thing that's been really exciting about the bike bus at my school yeah. is it's so many kids and parents that like you can't look away. Right. It's like one of those things like our our uh, commissioner, uh, Joanne Hardesty, who runs the Portland Bureau of Transportation, saw the first video and was like, this is amazing. And then yeah. she wanted to come out to see it for herself. Yeah. You know, it's like you when you see this many kids – it's like, what is going on? Like, I want to be a part of this. Like, it gets you out of your comfort zone, gets you to think about things differently and be like, wait a minute, this is possible. Like, this can be done. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, another one of the things that uh, really sort of bubbled up, um, especially, uh, I think, not necessarily because of the pandemic, but it just it, it was one of the things that sort of hit the airwaves and really became um, a, a salient sort of um, uh, theme is the school street program and how important school streets are. Um, I had the privilege of and honor of having Will Norman from London on the podcast here a few weeks ago, and it was wonderful the, to talk with him about how uh, they've been trying to roll school streets out. They've got some 350 school streets plus that they've rolled out. Um, you're pretty passionate about that too. Why don't you tell yeah. a little bit about that and then we'll, we'll roll the video. Yeah, again, I mean, you think about it as an educator who's had to deal with the chaos of school arrival and dismissal, um, seeing the impacts of pollution and inactivity on my students, you know, even your most skilled transportation planner can't get student trans like arrival and dismissal protocols, right. Right. Where it supports children walking, biking, parents driving the bus in a safe, inclusive and equitable way. Yeah. Um, why don't you why don't you really like literally explain what we're talking yeah, sure. about when we're talking about this yeah. chaos that takes place right at the school? Oh, geez. I mean, the I don't know if I always want to like relive the trauma of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's sort of this thing. Usually uh, school arrival, you know, protocols are sort of left to the specialists and the paras and like maybe the admin comes out and you know, there's this like pride of the ad, the principal who opens up the doors for the parents driving right. at this, you know, for the kids. And like at the same time, completely ignoring the children who are walking and biking to school. Right. Um, and it just creates that unsafe environment. Yeah. And the thing that's beautiful about school streets is you just 
are closing off to cars the road in front of the school. Right. You know, you're sort of saying this space is not for you. And I went to London this past spring break and to see the conviction that their city leaders and their staff have about, no, you don't get to drive your kid right to the front door. Right. And parents like, again, at no fault to themselves, if parents were allowed to drive into the school building and drop their kid off at the front of the classroom, they would. Right. But if (laughs) there's no cars moving, you know, it's like at a mall, you know, If there's no cars moving and it's safe, they'll drop their kid off a half a mile away if their kid is safe for those half a mile. Yeah, I I love it. I think you set up this video perfectly with that. Um, uh, Again, this is this is one um, that you helped uh, bring to fruition and uh, with Clarence with uh, uh, with Street Films. And again, Clarence is a good friend and he was uh, uh, did the honor of of being on my 100th episode that we did at uh, the end of this past year. So uh, let's uh, let's hit play and have some fun with uh, this special uh, film that you helped uh, pull together, Street Films. Special correspondent, I love it. I'm a physical education teacher who has taught for over a decade in Washington, D.C., Boston, Massachusetts, and Portland, Oregon. I have seen firsthand the chaos of school arrival and dismissal protocol. When I learned about school streets in London, I knew I had to see it for myself. I went to London for spring break and I met with city councilors, city planners, and parent advocates to talk and learn more about school streets. School streets is a road outside of school with a temporary restriction on motorist traffic at school arrival and dismissal. The restriction applies to school traffic and through traffic. The result is a safer, healthier, and more pleasant environment for everyone. In the past 12 months, 350 school streets have been delivered across London to tackle children's exposure to air pollution and improve their health. The mayor of London's study of school streets found they reduced air pollution by 23%, 18% parents drove less, and 81% of parents supported them. Listen to how lovely it sounds around the school. You can hear children and families engaging with one another. Such a lovely way to start your morning or end the day for your students. School Streets transforms the experience of arrival and dismissal from car-centered to student and family-centered. As an educator, School Streets are an incredible opportunity to create strong, healthy, safe, and connected school communities. Love it. Thank you. So cool. <laughs> that was great. Th- thank you for uh, indulging me and being able to uh, play that uh, on through and, and have some fun with it. I think it was just, um, I, I was so excited when that, uh, um, when it came up and, um, it, and I saw that you had done that with, with Clarence and, and uh, had put that out and super, super excited that you just, you got so inspired and took it upon yourself and said, gee, what am I going to do for spring break? <laughs> yeah, I have a very supportive wife. <laughs> yeah. It's very important to have supportive uh, partners, more, more, yeah. most definitely. <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> well, I was actually, uh, we had a family trip, the spring break of uh, March 2020. And mm-hmm. so our trip got canceled. Yeah. So because of the pandemic, so the first opportunity I had, I uh, was like, I got to see this for myself. You know, it's like yeah. you see the videos, you see, you read about it. You're like, it can't be this good. Right. You know, right. you kind of have to see it for yourself. Yeah. And uh, it was a yeah. really great trip. Now, we won't play much of this, but I want to at least just give uh, folks uh, a, a little bit of an idea as to what it is we're we're comparing this to so we just saw that environment here there and um 
and this is kind of what we're comparing it to. <laughs> so the insanity of people driving, you know, their kids. And like you said, if they could, they'd probably drive them right into the classroom themselves. Um, and so that's that's the challenge. That's what we're trying to, to fight against. And you, you talked about it earlier in terms of the compelling reasons why, you know, it, it's so much healthier for kids. There's so much uh, that they gain from sociability of being with friends and being able to, to do things. Um, so what's next when it comes to school streets in uh, in your area, in Portland, of being able to to actually do what you saw and replicate what you saw there in London. Yeah, so the city of Portland has a pilot that I know of at two schools that they're you know testing out, um, and sort of I hope it's positive and the city rolls it out more. Um, but I think you know there's this really important we have sort of a different dynamic of how we do enforcement where in London, they do a lot of camera enforcement. So there's not, it's not required that, you know, staff or parents are sort of standing and putting up a barrier. Um, It still does happen like you saw in the video. Um, But in Portland, we wouldn't have, at least right now, cameras uh, out to ticket people who uh, drove through the school streets. And so I think something I've been really working on in uh, sort of with other advocates in Portland and in Oregon is finding ways to have more flexibility with student transportation funds. So the state um, has funds to support student transportation, but right now, and I'm sure Oregon's not the only state, you can only spend those funds on school buses. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so, you know, they're, they're called student transportation funds, but we right. can only spend it on school buses. Right. And with the school bus driver shortage, there's just going to be an excess amount of funds that the yeah. state's not going to spend. And I think it's really important and we're, you know, working to try to get flexibility to those funds to sort of allow the school community to decide what service is best. How can those funds best support student transportation? Right. Yeah. And I think that's something that I'm really interested in, you know, finding ways to create more resiliency with our student transportation policies, you know, where we're not just coming up with like these uh, climate policies. Portland Public Schools just created a climate policy and it's like go electric vehicles, get electric buses, promote walking and biking to school. But it's like, we need to do more. We need to actually put funds to support and facilitate those initiatives. Yeah, yeah. So this is a, an article from uh, uh, 2021 in December. Jonathan Moss uh, with uh, BikePortland.org uh, put this together. And Jonathan's been doing wonderful stuff for many, many years. Um, uh, basically, you know, creating this content and uh, you, you're you have a little uh, a blurb here on this and it looks like if i'm reading this correctly yeah that's the school streets uh sort of pilot or whatever and the pbot uh um, the the portland bureau of transportation um uh, initiative there and uh it looks like you're doing sort of a compare and contrast between uh, portland versus paris yeah i think that's what jonathan was kind of going for yeah yeah got um, it yeah, yeah, I appreciate that the city of Portland's trying to do something. Yeah. Um, but just putting the signs out when they look so close to other signs that yeah. we sort of trade people that they can drive yeah. the slow street signs, it's just a little, you know, it's not clear to those parents. But, you know, when there is, there's a, another video somewhere where there was a teacher who was standing out front enforcing it. Yeah. And then it's, it works. Yeah. yeah. And so... Um, but yeah, this, the school streets in Paris and what they're doing in Barcelona with school streets with not only like closing off the road, they're reclaiming space and creating right. plazas and creating space for socializing and physical distancing. And just like, you know, Barcelona, Milan, it's like these amazing tactical urbanism projects where they're incorporating the students in them. Right. I mean, there's just so much opportunity to sort of create and to bring community together 
um, with our streets. And like you said, streets are for people. And yeah. I always think that just streets are such a beautiful canvas for creativity. And um, I think that's just something I'm always going to, you know, be sort of looking at and trying to do with the communities I'm fortunate to work with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love that you uh, channeled uh, Barcelona there a little bit because we had that wonderful video of the the, the bike bus uh, in in Barcelona. And of course, Barcelona is famous because of the super blocks that they're working on where they're really traffic calming. They're bringing those speeds down in those nine block grids um, and, and really making those areas, basically reclaiming street space creating uh you know super pedestrian spaces creating plazas where there were no plazas basically creating plazas out of what used to be multi-lane intersections really kind of just again what we were talking about streets for people reimagining what those streets are for sam we, we've come to the end uh but is there anything that we haven't yet covered either in school streets or the walking bus or the bike buses that you want to leave everybody with no i think uh i think we've done a really good job i just um i think it's it's just this has been a really it's an amazing space it's an amazing community and i think it's just so important that we just don't throw up our hands to cars and sort of say like there's nothing we can do yeah and i really think that there's you know, it's challenging. It's not easy. We're moving a boulder up a hill, but we're making lots of progress. And I think, you know, John, having active towns, having a space that, you know, brings us together to share thoughts and ideas has been really helpful for myself. You know, I'm sure I'm not the only one that really gains a lot of, exper- uh, you know, excitement and ideas from, you know, services that you're providing with this. So yeah. thank you for what you do. And thank you for having me on. Well, thank you, you know, for saying so. And, and it's a real honor to, to be able to, uh, you know, be able to send emails out and be able to, you know, ping people on social media and say, hey, would you like to do this? <laughs> and uh, I've been uh, incredibly uh, honored to be able to and grateful to, to be able to have so many wonderful folks on, including yourself, Sam Balto, Coach Sam Balto. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been a real honor. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Coach Sam Balto uh, talking about walking school buses, bike buses, and school streets. And if you did, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Leave a comment down below. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, make sure you hit that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell right next to it to indicate what your notifications preferences might be. And if you haven't done so already, please pop on over to the Active Town store and check out some of my fun Streets are for People swag that's out there. Uh, New lower prices on everything, t-shirts, hats, water bottles, everything's been lowered in in terms of price, uh, trying to make it as accessible as possible to all of you. And again, I'm not making very much money from any of this, uh, but it does help, every little bit helps. And speaking of every little bit helps, If you can support me on Patreon, um, that would be a huge, huge help. Uh, Again, every dollar adds up and it allows me the ability to continue producing this content and getting it out to you. Uh, Consider it like a monthly tip, if you will. (laughs) So again, patreon.com slash active towns. Pop on over there. If you have the ability to support the channel, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And a quick reminder about the two Active Town study tours coming up at the end of August. I'll be heading to Colorado to film a couple of events there and uh, get on the ground uh, filming some of the infrastructure, uh, talking with some folks. Uh, If you're interested in tagging along, uh, be sure to send me an email. And that's John, that's J-O-H-N, at activetowns.org. And then the second trip is at the end of October into November, uh, heading to the Netherlands. Going to be uh, attending the International National Cargo Bike Festival for the first three days and then after that spending some time in Utrecht, Delft and uh, obviously Amsterdam and Rotterdam as well. So if you're interested in tagging along for that, again, send me an email at john, that's G-O-H-N, at activetowns.org. Well, that's all for this episode. So until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health and happiness. Cheers. <laughs>